All right, so if everybody is ready, I wish to introduce myself. My name is Suzanne Bissonnette, and I will be your host today. On behalf of Jubilant Radio Pharma, I wish to thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to participate in our live virtual endocrinology series webinar. The topic today is very provocative, active surveillance versus I-131 therapy in low-risk thyroid cancer. Before I introduce you to our speaker, let me review a few logistics items. All participants will be on mute. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to formulate your questions. We will address them at the end of the presentation. Finally, note that this program is not CE or CME accredited. However, it's a fantastic program. I'm sure you will enjoy it. I wish you a fruitful session, and without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Douglas Van Nostrom. Dr. Van Nostrom is the Director of Nuclear Medicine Research at the MedStar Research Institute and the MedStar Washington Hospital Center. He is a Professor of Medicine at Georgetown University School of Medicine. His 30-plus career a year's career has been stellar in the field of nuclear medicine. Dr. Van Nostrom won numerous awards, including the Soul Hertz Award 2020 Lifetime Achievement Award in I-131 Diagnosis and Therapy of Differentiated Thyroid Cancer. Dr. Van Nostrom published more than 300 abstracts, articles, chapters, and 10 books, and has dedicated his life to patients suffering from thyroid cancer. And now, Dr. Van Nostrom, uh, you may begin your presentation. Thank you, Suzanne. Appreciate that introduction and welcome to everyone. I believe and I, I hope you will find this presentation of value, uh, whether you're a physician or a nuclear medicine technologist or an endocrinologist, uh, all of this relates to a very important area of our specialty of nuclear medicine involving active surveillance versus I-131 therapy in low-risk uh, thyroid cancer. Now, uh, before beginning, I would like to uh, further acknowledge all the efforts that have gone into this uh, arrangement of this program by Suzanne Bissonnette and also by uh, Donna Shork. Uh, these things uh, on the surface, when they go really, really well, people don't realize all the effort that's gone in to make them go really, really well. And I can give testimony that both Suzanne and Donna have done a tremendous job in putting together this program electronically and uh, virtually. I also wanna thank uh, Jubilant Radio Pharma. Uh, there are many, many commercial companies out there and they're an important member of the team, one of the sisters and brothers of the, of the team of healthcare. Uh, but what separates out for me regarding Jubilant Radio Pharma is their commitment to programs such as this, uh, programs that affect nuke med and radiotherapy, I-131 therapy and imaging. And I especially want to point out that this is not a commercial presentation. This presentation is totally designed by me. Uh, Jubilant has no uh, control over it. Uh, these are my thoughts, and that's really a great quality when the commercial company will support such a program like this, but it's not a commercial uh, like on TV or some other uh, commercial presentations that one may see. Now, I don't want to belittle companies that put on commercial presentations, but rather I want to acknowledge that Jubilant's really been great in supporting this without having commercial input regarding uh, this presentation. Now my presentation uh, will have my email address at the end and I'll make some comments on that in the beginning. So it's active surveillance, which is you know, our, in our lingo and in our uh, jargon we call watchful waiting, where some even say it's less is more. <clears throat> and for I-131 therapy, we often say, well, why wait? in these low risk thyroid cancer patients with I-131. And sometimes we call that more is less. Give a little bit more and there's less recurrence. Um, so whatever your 
jargon is, I'm going to use watchful waiting and why wait? Now, in regard to my financial disclosures, I am an advisor for Jubilant Draximage and ASI. And I'm going to have another unusual disclaimer for you, which is that with these virtual presentations and giving out my email, I've violated one of the first rules of PowerPoint. And that first rule is be brief, use a significant amount of text in your slides. Well, I'm not. I'm going to use more text in my slides than is typically recommended. And that's because if you use my email and ask a copy of the slide presentation, then you may not have the, the verbal content of the, of the virtual presentation to particularly understand that slide. So I've often included more text to help you understand that. <clears throat> And what I'll try to do is highlight some of the key points as we go through of a lot of the text. And here is my email address. It's my first and last name, all is one. This will again appear at the end of the program at gmail.com. So what, the, what are the objectives of this session? And it's really to list the two major management approaches of low risk disease. It's to discuss the limitations and reservations and lamentations of these articles that are supporting less is more, in other words, watchful waiting or more is less, which is why wait? And I'm going to be bold and provocative to say, how do we resolve that controversy? And then to briefly describe future initiatives, depending upon how much time we have left. And I do want to leave time left for questions. Now, uh, Suzanne, uh, normally I have a timer going but presently I do not have a timer here, so I will need your help uh, and giving me a signal uh, when I'm at about 40 minutes. Very well. So a little word of wisdom from the past from Mark Twain. I mean, I find a lot of his statements are very provocative, simple on the surface, but very important. It ain't what don't you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. In other words, what gets us into trouble is by saying, oh, everybody with this particular situation has, should have watchful waiting or should have an I-131 therapy. And I know that that's what we're supposed to do or a guideline tells us that. Guidelines are only that, guidelines. Uh, and it's so we often take these as sacrosanct and now it's, we know for sure that, that and it ain't necessarily the best for the patient. Now, we all have areas in common, or well, we all have more of those areas in common than differences, and we should all celebrate our differences. They should not be battlegrounds or heated arguments at various society meetings or panel discussions. Rather, these differences should be really our workbench of progress. And then to look at various ways on how we can try to manage these differences, do additional studies to try to resolve them. So objective one is list the two major management approaches to low risk disease, the two differences. And one is, as we already know, active surveillance, and that's known as watchful waiting or less is more, as I mentioned in the title, or I-131 adjuvant treatment, which is why wait or more is less, more activity, meaning that there's less recurrence later on. Now, there's a lot of articles supporting both sides. And here's just a few from the ATA guidelines. And there's a lot of articles supporting the other guidelines. And I could go through these data and I would hope, no, I would not hope, I would project that most of you would be asleep in another two minutes. Rather, I hope that I keep you alerted. And what I want to do is only let you know of one to be aware of it, that there is activity by Verberg showing that there's benefit in low risk disease, which is not no risk disease. And in this, you see that, uh, actually it's in this next slide here, and that in this slide on the left, you're looking at cumulative specific survival and on the x-axis, you're looking at years of specific survival, and you're looking at the black arrow, I mean, the black line showing you patients who were treated with less than 2,000 
mega becquerels, which is about 54 millicuries, and those treated with more than 54 millicuries. So I'm presenting this because often, and I'm not gonna go through all the articles, but just to remind people, there are articles that do support why wait? Why not go ahead and treat with I-131? And this is an example of that in which Verberg showed that treating with greater than even just what I consider a small amount of 54 millicuries, one can demonstrate, at least in his study, uh, improvement in survival, going from the black solid line to the dotted line. Now, rather than discussing, I go back and discuss the pros and cons of the articles uh, supporting watchful waiting or the other articles or Verberg's pros and cons. What I really wanna do is I wanna discuss the limitations and reservations and lamentations of those articles. And there are at least nine that I have, and there may be more that others have identified, uh, but I'm gonna focus in on those nine. So first and foremost, is none of these studies are prospective. They're all retrospective studies. And that's the favorite thing we point out. And even if there is a potential prospective study or a prospective study that's potentially useful, there's other limitations with that. But in essence, they're retrospective and not prospective. And no randomized control prospective study has been published that has long enough follow-up, and I'll comment on that in a minute, long enough follow-up really comparing these two strategies. So number two is this concept of an absence of evidence is not evidence of an absence. Now, I don't, I don't know who first said this, but this, this was like taking a hammer and hitting me over the head and bringing something that's very important. Because a study shows no difference between two therapies or two management approaches, that is not evidence that there isn't a difference. There are many factors that go into a study. And one of the most important things for a study to really show statistically that there's no difference between the two managements is it needs to be a non-inferiority study. Well, what's a non-inferiority study? It's a study that has a lot of power to reach statistical significance that when one says there's no difference between the management A and management B, it's highly, highly unlikely that there is a difference. But how do you get power? And power means high numbers of observation and prospective. So an absence of evidence, and these are all retrospective studies for not very long period of time, is not evidence of an absence. But I'll address this more later even. So no non-inferiority study has been published regarding the effectiveness of I-131 adjuvant treatment versus active surveillance in low-risk disease. Now, item number three is, as I've already hinted earlier, is not enough follow-up. So if we follow patients for three years, is that long enough, five years? How long do you have to follow it? This slide is a courtesy of Dr. Marcus Luster from Marsburg, Germany, in which he took the data from Anasaka's uh, article in JCEM. Anasaka is now the uh, senior editor for the thyroid um, <clears throat> journal. And in this very nice paper, what she looked at is I-131 effectiveness in reducing cancer recurrence. Now, what, what, what's really interesting is in order to see this, one had to have, in other words, a statistical difference, one had to have at least 17 years in the Ohio State study, 10 years in UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, 11 years from MD Anderson, and, and 12 years from Pisa, Italy. So in other words, to reach statistical significance, to show I-131 effectiveness for cancer recurrence, it wasn't enough to do three years, four years, five years, eight years. These were 10, 11, 12, and 17. So when one is hearing a presentation, I'm not saying that one should do watchful waiting or why wait, but one needs to be more critical of what one's hearing regarding what was the mean follow-up of these patients. Now, if one actually 
looked at effectiveness of mortality, there was only one study from Ohio State in which the, the data was statistically significant and they had to go 17 years. So the biggest single problem we deal with low risk patients, and not all of these patients I admit are low risk patients, but these, these data emphasize the importance of follow-up because even if these aren't low risk and they're in, intermediate, it indicates you have to go a long time in order to show a difference. So put that in your bonnet, keep that in mind. It's important that the studies be carried out for a significant amount of time. That of course is our biggest single problem with these patients because by the time one goes 17, 20 years, a lot of people are moving on to another facility or retiring. Now, not enough follow-up. Number four is promulgation of incorrect conclusion. In other words, good data, but maybe the conclusion isn't correct for the data. So let's take a look at this. Dr. Castagna from Italy. Maria is an outstanding physician, good researcher. I actually have her working with me on an international committee we're working on, published a very, very nice paper. And I believe her conclusion, her summary was correct but we'll analyze that a little farther. Now I've distilled that article down into a single slide, gotta make life easy. And she was evaluating 30 millicuries versus 100 millicuries. Again, we're looking at promulgation of incorrect conclusion. Now, if you looked at all patients for recurrent disease, biochemical disease, metastasis, death, 30 millicuries versus 100, they're not significant, they're the same. And if you look at T3NOx, I won't go through that, but the important thing is for the same group, there's no difference and same for the next group and same for T3N1. And what Maria concluded was, and I believe it's very reasonable, is that our study provides the first evidence that in patients at intermediate risk disease, this is an even low risk disease, higher activities have no major advantage over lower activities. I'm okay with that. I think that's fine. Here's where the issue of promulgating incorrect conclusions comes. There have been 13 articles, which I haven't listed, but if someone wants them, I'm happy to send the references out, that took Maria's article and changed it to 30 millicuries is equally as effective as 100 millicuries. And, and that, that may be a fair statement, but it has the innuendo that they're both having a good effect. They're effective. I would submit to you all in the audience, who's happy with, with occurrence rates or biochemical disease or persistent disease of 40%, 26%, 47%, 41%. I'm not happy with that. Why couldn't one in interpret this data as 30 millicuries is equally as ineffective as 100 millicuries? It's not enough. We need to give more. Now, the issue then is promulgation of incorrect conclusion. And there's been 13 articles, as I mentioned, that 30 millicuries has been promoted as effective as 100 millicuries. And then that becomes gospel. It could in fact be as equally ineffective and we need to move more. So we have retrospective studies. We have not long enough time. Uh, we have incorrect conclusions that really need to be considered in the reservations regarding all the published data on both sides of the question. Now, another concern is moving patients that were staged previously as intermediate risk to low risk disease. So here is a summary, uh, and, I, and I, I like to recognize where I got this, but I don't remember where I received this, so I can't go, do, due diligence and acknowledge. But here is the ATA 2009 guidelines. And then there is a group of six criteria for intermediate risk disease. And in the ATA 2015 guidelines, it's been moved over into the low risk group. Well, I don't have problems with that until one really needs to assess that movement to low risk because Back to Mark Twain, we start to go, well, they're a low risk group, we'll do active surveillance, why wait? And I'll talk about another one coming up. 
And hey, we could always treat later. Well, can you? And we'll discuss that further. But let's look at these six. What really is low risk? A recurrence rate in distant Mets in less than 1%? Well, that sounds pretty low because that's a wide category. It could be 0.01%, but how about 1%, 1 in 100? So 1 in 100 are going to come back with metastatic disease. And with due respect for a large portion of my career, what I've treated is those patients with metastatic disease. But then the argument might be is, well, I got to treat 100 patients in order to help the one. Well, maybe we do. We need to look at cost benefit. We need to look at risk to that treatment versus the likelihood of metastatic disease and shortening life. What if it's 5%? Well, hmm, getting up there. How about 10%? So if we look at this, this group, and I'm going to highlight it here, <clears throat> this group PN1 without external note is 2%. This multifocal PMC is 4 to 6%. Well, I hear a lot of times that in our conferences, well, they got uh, multifocal microscopic papillary thyroid cancer. That's low risk disease to watchful waiting. We can always treat later. Well, should we be? And how about intrathyroid? 5%, PN1, all lymph nodes. That's mean PN1s, meaning the cancer is already in the lymph nodes, but it's small. It's less than 2%. That's become low risk disease, but that's got a 5% potential recurrence rate. And Here's another one, 5%. And this PT3 is 3 to 8%. So what really is low risk disease? Again, I'm not coming out to you to say, well, anybody that's less than 1% should be watchful waiting, or anyone that's 10% should be why wait, or 5% or whatever. What I'm trying to do is to provoke one's thought process not to automatically do a Mark Twain and say, well, I know what it is. It should be watchful waiting. No, that may not be the best for this this patient, and by whose standard do we use? Your standard, my standard, guideline standards, or, or consensus? And playing the seed for another category, we'll talk about consensus in a minute. Interesting, the European Consensus Conference and the Latin American Thyroid Society uh, recognized the difficulty of this low-risk group and that the low-risk group was becoming bigger and bigger. And there may be categories of well less than 1% and maybe a category of 8%. And they broke it into very low risk or low risk disease. I think that's helpful. That's by Pacini and Car Car Camargo. Number seven is you can always treat later that I alluded to. Well, well let's be wary of this premise. So you can always treat later, but not necessarily as well. It, it's well accepted, I would say, that we usually like to treat and cure early. You can always treat better if you cure now than if you treat later. Number eight is consensus. Now, in the absence of good evidence, and I'm guilty of this in designing guidelines and anyone who develops guidelines, we turn the consensus is one of the surrogates that we use to help develop our guidelines. But again, my agenda here, not hidden agenda, but overt agenda, is to get one to think more critically regarding consensus. Be wary of a consensus. In the 1920s, the consensus was that the Roaring Twenties would roar on and we would all have a great time and party on it, party hardy and on. And what happened, of course, is what you know, the Great Depression. Consensus does not necessarily have anything to do with truth. In the late 1500s and early 1600s, the universal consensus was that the sun rotated around the earth. And this fellow came along, Galileo, and actually Copernicus, uh, came along and he stated that mm, uh, the sun didn't run, rotate around the earth. And, but the consensus was that it was, it, it did, and he was actually, as many of you probably know, sentenced to be excommunicated. Now, being a smart human being and not dying on a sword that he was right, he recanted and he did not get excommunicated, he did not get um, 
uh, executed, but so much for consensus. Now, these are two good examples, and one might say, well, you know, these are just really bad examples. No, it's very frequent. <clears throat> the, and I'll come back to this in a minute, we only have to look at what's happening in our society regarding consensus, regarding six feet, masks, and vaccinations. Very difficult regarding consensus. Now, I think Galileo made another really interesting statement that I included here. In the sciences, the authority of thousands of opinions, and I'd keep this in mind for COVID, is not worth as much as one tiny spark of reason in an individual man. And again, to summarize this up, this is not just in the 15, 1600s, and it's not just the roaring 20s. It's been throughout history, and even today, regarding COVID-19, as I mentioned, and the articles by Marie uh, that referenced Marie uh, Castagna was a consensus that 30 millicuries is as good as 100 millicuries. That's a consensus, and that's not necessarily true. Now, number nine, and the last one, is a simple falsehood is better than a complex truth. I really like this. In other words, something that's simple, it, just, just give me what to do. Uh, I don't want the, all the nuances and the complex truth of management. Just give me the simple falsehood. And of course, that's one of the problems from the guidelines. Now, the guidelines, whether it's from the ATA or European uh, Thyroid Association or the Society of Nuclear Medicine, they clearly state it's a guideline. It's not a simple falsehood. But the problem often is we, the user, want simple falsehoods because it's much easier to just deal with that and move forward. Does this cliche creep into medicine? I submit to you that it does. And I'm confident that no one does this consciously. However, the, there are many, many forces working on us. There's my manager, there's my uh, administrator director, improve efficiencies. How many RVUs are you doing? Uh, this can directly or indirectly affect our practices that we don't even know about. A simple falsehood that makes things seem easier can directly affect patient care and really be a falsehood. And this subconsciously can affect us rec favoring a recommendation like Alex active surveillance or I-131 just because it's easier. How does this do it? Less time spent on patient education. Let's back up on this. Let's emphasize this. Physicians, although there is a code for helping to be reimbursed for patient education, Patient education is not reimbursed well, and so there is a subconscious, and in some cases, conscious decision to minimize patient education. For example, oh, well, Mrs. Smith, active surveillance is the way to go. We highly recommend that. We'll set you up for an appointment in uh, four months, six months. Boom, we're done. I don't have to explain all that complex truth. It discourages patients' questions. It is no informed consent for active surveillance. And you can think of other mechanisms that encourage us subconsciously to just automatically recommend active surveillance. And it results in increased productivity, less liability, or rightly and wrongly, it almost gives a sense to the patient that, hey, my problem's not very bad. The doctor said all we need to do is active surveillance. Well, that may be true, but it may not be the correct management and there's less apparent confusion within the patient or the patient's family members. So let's walk through these limitations and reservations. Retrospective and not prospective. Absence of evidence is not evidence of an absence. We need inferiority prospective study. Follow-up is not long enough, across the board virtually. You can always treat later. I have difficulty with that. Promulgation of incorrect conclusions. Moving patients that were staged as intermediate risk to one low large risk category that then has multiple percentages in it. What really is low risk? Consensus and think of Galileo when you hear what the consensus is. Be cautious of the forces that encourage simple falsehoods 
is better than a complex truth. Objective three, resolving the controversy in the management of active surveillance versus I-131 therapy, watchful waiting versus why wait? Am I really gonna resolve that? I think I am, that's a bold task. So if you guess that my position favors watchful waiting, you'd be completely wrong. And if you thought I was why wait, you'd be completely wrong. My position is personalized medicine. Every patient needs to be managed individually. And personalized medicine means staging. Let me interrupt here. Susan, how are we doing for time? We're at 9.30, sir. Pardon? 9.30, sir. 9.30 minutes left? Uh, yeah, 30 minutes left. 30 minutes. Oh, we're in good shape. So we will have some time for questions at the end. Great. So personalized medicine, it, it's not just staging and... Look, it's the stage, therefore, it's A, therefore we do B. But to do full staging, you need adequate staging. You need a pre-therapy diagnostic SAN to maximize staging. I'm a major advocate of that. Part of the problem with pre-therapy diagnostic scans is many of the facilities will say, the scan really doesn't alter my staging. Well, that may be true, but one also needs to assess the scans and the quality of the scans that one's getting. And there is a big difference. These are publications of facilities and authors that perform SPEC CT. And then they assessed retrospectively whether it altered management. Now, assessing outcomes is much harder, but altering management is our next best thing. And they, they are 22%, 42%, 27%. And there's not just seven of them here. There's another seven in the second set, 25%, 35%, 23%. Now, this is one might say, oh, well, we can't trust the consensus, true. But this is published work. Yeah, but they're retrospective, true. But this is still good supporting evidence that scans performed well will alter management. Appropriate preparation for the patient for pre-therapy diagnostic scans. Is that facility assessing adequate elevation? If you're not, you're not gonna get good quality to begin with. And you don't know that unless you're measuring the TSH if you're doing thyroid hormone withdrawal. Low iodine diets, there's controversies on that, but there is data supporting it. It's a little inconvenient to the patient, but even more important, how is one verifying that they were on a low iodine diet? Well, Mrs. Smith, were you on a low iodine diet? Oh, yes, Dr. Van. How long were you on it? I was on it for two weeks. Boy, that's a tough diet. How do I know she was on it? I don't. I have to test for iodine in the urine. 24-hour urine iodine collections are difficult, but you can do spot urine iodine collections. And even better, um, by uh, Chu is looking at the creatinine to iodine ratio in a spot urine sample. Confirming low iodine in the urine then is very, very important. Number five is appropriate performance of that pre-therapy diagnostic scan. Not all radioiodine scans have been, are created equal, as I've already alluded to, and this has been published in an article in Thyroid. Here's an example of a standard whole body scan. And in the top of it, I don't know if you see my arrow, but there's a large area of thyroid tissue. There's these spokes coming off of it, which is, many of you know, is a star artifact from all that radioactivity present penetrating the septa. The rest of the whole body image uh, shows no focal areas of activity. Here's a pinhole collimator spot image of this area. And here is the image. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Those aren't markers. Now we've done a study retrospective but we looked at what surgeons typically leave behind after a near total thyroidectomy. And it's rarely over four, occasionally five, maybe occasionally six, but not 13. This is sine qua non from metastatic disease to the soft tissue or most likely the lymph nodes of the thyroid bed. And in this patient, the patient would have been read, well, that surgeon left a lot of tissue behind. 
Yeah, they left a lot of tissue behind, but it's all in metastatic lymph nodes. Technique makes a difference. This is not as infrequent as one thinks. That's the article, 2019 in thyroid. Number six, genomic and molecular testing is becoming important. I won't dwell on it now. There's comorbidities to look at. These are all the things we got to consider in personalized medicine. Benefit versus risk. What's the risk of low radioiodine administered for one time versus the potential benefits at 10 years? If, if they're going to develop metastatic disease, it's worth it. And then there's a the cost analysis, but benefit versus risk needs to be considered. Another very important thing is what's the patient's desires? Is the patient a minimalist or a maximalist? And there's a book put out called Your Medical Mind by Dr. Gutman and Hartspan. It's really an outstanding book. And whether you're a practicing physician or a practicing nuclear medicine technologist, I recommend this for you as a future patient. And it's a very simple read, but the concept is first understanding your own medical mind. In one situation with a 1% risk, you might say, hey, I'm not doing anything. I'm gonna live with that 1% risk. And you're a minimalist. Or with a 1% risk, you might say, no, I, I wanna have treatment. And you're a maximalist. And there's gonna be differences of opinions regarding the same clinical situation by a patient on whether they'll be a minimalist or a maximalist. Maybe due to their age, they may be due to their comorbidities, they may be due to their additional ability to assume risk and live with it, and others who can't live with risk. So, and it's also, is the patient comfortable with treating later? Now, a, fine, a near final one, but another one is patient compliance if you're doing active surveillance, or even why wait? So compliance is going to be important in deciding that treatment for the patient. 10 to 20 years, are they gonna come back for follow-up or they'll be lost to follow-up? A short story, I was doing a presentation at a very large endocrinology division, and I won't mention who it was or where it was, but uh, it was a big practice and the practice said, we have ne never seen a patient with metastatic disease. And my comment was, well, how do you know they're not going to MD Anderson or MedStar Washington Hospital Center or Memorial Sloan Kettering or Mayo Clinic? These patients are coming back. And with patient compliance, of course, is the ability to follow that patient uh, in that facility. Second, uh, the uh, 12th is the physician work environment. And this is an area which then goes back to RVUs and issues like that. It's rarely talked about, but it exists. What facility forces our work on the physician practice? The pushes, as we've already discussed, for RVUs first versus patient first. Of course, we all say patient first, but it's not always patient first. Should you be able to treat this even though you only treat a couple of these patients a year? So we should treat this, but we only treat two a year, or maybe you shouldn't be treating this. And a good option is referring it to an institution. And it may even be a competing institution, but there's nothing embarrassing about that and certainly an option to consider, but there may be the physician work environments that you don't refer to at competing institutions. What are your capabilities of your clinic or medif medical facilities? I was aware of one facility that would only give 30 to 100 millicuries because they were outpatient, and wouldn't give anything more than 100. So therefore, the capability of that clinic became the determinant for the maximum of I-131 activity to be administered. Insurance coverage, what's the coverage? Specific issues of various country healthcare systems. Objective four is described future initiatives. And I won't go into great detail to this, but there are efforts out there with the Estamibi tool from, uh, not from Fiance, but from France and ION from Great Britain. And <clears throat> these are a good effort, but now with the things that we previously discussed, in comparing 30 millicuries of active surveillance versus uh, of active I-131 therapy versus surveillance, they're gonna look at it for five years. This already raises concern. 750 is good for a non-inferiority study, 
But now, hopefully, with this presentation, one's going to go, well, maybe five years isn't long enough. Now, this may have been modified since I put this slide together because I haven't, I haven't rechecked to update it. But the Estimibi study then is a randomized trial to look at 30 millicuries. Uh, in other words, uh, ablation or I-131 adjuvant treatment, depending upon your definition versus active surveillance. Again, it's an issue of three years, five years, randomization is good, prospective is good, and it's in the low risk group. <clears throat> and here is the inclusion criteria, and we'll have to see what the data shows for that. Uh, it's presently, as I understand, not actively recruiting. It was first posted in 2013, and last update was August of 2021. We'll have to see what happens. Now, <clears throat> another study is the IOM study, and this is courtesy of Dr. Verberg, and this is uh, radioiodine ablation really necessary at all for low-risk disease. Uh, the same issues here is the same as 30 millicuries. It says nothing about whether or not higher activities will have better outcomes. So maybe there is no difference. And the interesting thing is 30 millicuries and 100 millicuries per Dr. Castagna had no difference. Then why? And But then we're thinking that they're equally effective. If we look at 30 millicuries versus no treatment and they show no difference, that just may mean that 30 millicuries is like doing nothing and 100 millicuries is like doing nothing. So we really actually need to be looking in my own editorial as higher activities with the ion. We'll have to see what happens with that. So, but there's good efforts out there and they're applauded for their uh, initiative and effort in putting together these prospective studies. So in summary, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you think you know for sure that just ain't so. We have more things in common than differences. We should celebrate those differences in our conversations, whether it's nuke med physician with endocrinologists or with patients. And we need that to be our workbench for progress and also to really look at personalized medicine. And in the authority of a thousand, and in the sciences consensus, the authority of thousands of opinions is not necessarily worth as much as one tiny spark of reason in an individual. We've already been through these nine, which I won't go through again. And for risk thyroid cancer, my position is less is more. And by less is more, I mean less interpreting guidelines as sacrosanct and more personalized medicine and asking the question, why wait? And with that, I'll turn that back over to Susan Bissonette. Here is my email address. I would like to thank my previous team of our Division of Nuclear Medicine at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. And I've stepped down from that position and now have a, a great group of individuals who help with our research. And we're looking forward to a, a post-COVID party my only problem with this slide is it was made almost two years ago and we haven't had our post-COVID party, which we hope we will have shortly. And with that, Suzanne, I'm happy to answer any questions.